Right, can everyone hear me? Right, that's great. So, my name's Sandeep, and um, today I want to talk to you about bundling your front end with Webpack. I was going to start with asking if everyone's heard of Webpack, but they have pretty much now. All right, so what is Webpack? Webpack essentially, at its core, is a module bundler. So what does it actually mean? Well, it takes in a bunch of assets and their dependencies and packages them into a bundle for the client. That's essentially all a module bundler does. Webpack has two core philosophies. The first one is every asset is a module. So usually modules are JavaScript, but in the Webpack world, CSS, HTML, and images are also modules as well. And the second philosophy is load only what you need, when you need. So typical module bundlers as a whole will take all your modules and stick them in a bundle.js. And essentially in the real world, that's a massive file if you've got a large JavaScript application. But what Webpack is built upon and its theory is that it can split code and it can bundle code separately. So you don't need to have the first initial hit of loading, say, the five megabytes with the Angular dependencies or your React dependencies. So how does Webpack actually work? So Webpack essentially takes an entry point, which is usually a JavaScript file, and it roams through your source code and looks for a lot of import statements or require statements, and it builds a dependency graph. And this dependency graph is basically a list of all the modules in the application that it needs. And what it does, it takes those modules and it compiles them down to a small set of bundles. It's usually one, but it can be multiple. It depends on the structure of your app and how big it is. So essentially, the modules systems that it supports are AMD, CommonJS, and in Webpack 2, the biggest change with Webpack 2, it supports ES6 imports. So this diagram illustrates that on the left is an example of all the dependency graph that you'd have in your source code, and to the right is the actual final bundle of what you're going to ship to the client in the browser. So there's multiple ways to run Webpack. You can do it via the command line interface that they have. You can do it based off a config file, or you can do it off a Node API. The most common way is to use a Webpack config file. So now we know what Webpack is, and how it roughly works. Why do you want to use Webpack? Because there's plenty of other build tools, and there's various other module bundlers, like Rollup is one of them. It's Webpack's competitor, and there's Browserify. But essentially, Webpack solves quite a few problems just out of the box. So one of them is dependencies loading out of order. So I'm guessing some of you in the web development world will have had this pain at one point where the scripts tags are in the wrong order, or you're trying to reference a jQuery plugin and jQuery has not been instantiated yet. Because Webpack has everything in a dependency graph, it knows the ordering of all your modules. So it'll pick the right ones in the correct order and load them as and when it needs. Second one, issue that it solves is bundling unused JavaScript in production. Webpack 2 especially has a feature called tree shaking in. So it'll only bundle up the modules which you import. If you've got four or five JavaScript files in your solutions which are modules and you don't use them and they're not required or imported anyway, it'll just leave them on disk. That's a any solution. Um, and another clever thing about Webpack is that if you're using vendor bundles, such as uh, so vendor libraries, such as like Lodash, and using only one or two functions out of that library, it will rip them out of the library and put them in the bundle by themselves. Um, so you don't need to package a whole of it. So your vendor library should be a lot smaller. And the biggest selling point of Webpack is code splitting. So back to the, one of their initial philosophies, especially with the rise of single page applications, Sometimes I've worked on single page applications where the initial app.js is maybe seven or eight meg. And we've got like spinners that come up and it'll say, okay, it's great. We rely on people's network connections. But code splitting is one of the core things of Webpack because it allows you to split the code up into smaller bundles. But also it's got a very neat feature around the fact that you can load modules on demand. So the bundles which you split up, you can require them Say, for instance, if you ever use React in the router, you can require them to say, OK, I've, I've found a new route. Now go get me the bundle that I want to load for this. So you never have it at the first initial one. It's basically on demand as you need it, um, which is a really cool feature. The next one is saving extra HTTP requests. So there's a lot around asset processing. Because all of the modules inside the application when using Webpack 
are all modules, so like images and CSS. You're allowed to do a lot of clever things. So you can inline SVG images um, and put them in a bundle.js if you think there's, if they're below a certain size limit, which will save a request. Now this is up to the developer and the team of how you want to do these sorts of things, but it gives you the flexibility that you don't have to load everything separately. You can bundle stuff together. And the last one is about versioning. So Webpack allows you to do asset hashing out of the box. It can, so everyone's used to seeing the query string at the end of a JavaScript library that says, okay, the client will pull this down, that's the latest version. But if you ever look in someone's browser, you'll see there's five versions of a vendor bundle. Um, the clever thing about versioning in Webpack is it allows you to put hash on the front of it, but it can it'll only recompile that hash and change that if there's new code in there. So you're allowed to do incremental builds. So when you go out in, into production, you don't actually get the same cache busting that you see on a lot of websites. So that's why I think Webpack's pretty cool. So this is, a, this is a common thing that comes up a lot, and I've been asked about this many a time, is how does it relate to things, uh, build tools like Grunt and Gulp, which are, a, which are task runners? And to be honest, they're two different things. Grunt and Gulp are task runners, and Webpack is a module bundler. They're just two different build tools and serve different purposes. Um, task runners are great for crunching through files and giving you an output. Um, so you can change your SAS into CSS, you can uglify and dehumanification, but they have no concept of a dependency graph. And they have no concept of what you want to serve to the client or how you want to bundle. So they become rather problematic when you want to try, basically, optimize your application. Because it's not built, task runners don't have that inherently in its design. Whereas Webpack is, the whole part of Webpack is about performance and giving the user the, and only bundling what you need to the client and giving the best experience possible. But I'm not saying not to use them together because they do work together. If you, Webpack solves certain problems and uh, task runners solve another problem. But what people, and I've actually found myself a lot, is that you will tend to replace your task runner with Webpack because it does a lot of what task runners do. It can do uh, translation from ES6 to Yes, five. It can do bundling. It can do minification. It has all of that out of the box. So now we know what Webpack is, how it kind of runs, and how it compares to other build tools. I want to go through the core concepts. There's four main concepts in Webpack, and if you can understand those, you can pretty much get 80 to 90 percent of the way of what you want to do with it. Because it's a big tool and it has a large API and it's a lot that it can do. But if you stick to the basics, you'll get to where you want fairly quickly. So on the right, we have just a very simple Webpack config. And one of the first concepts is entry point. So that is the way to start bundling and building the dependency graph. You can have multiple entry points, but in many cases, you just have one. So that's, for instance, in your own applications would be the first file that kicks off your application like a boot. Strap.js or an app.js. Second concept is loaders. And loaders are basically how Webpack transforms assets, which are not JavaScript, into modules. So that's how it handles PNGs and images, like, um, and then CSS files. So a loader has two conditions. It has a test one, which is a regular expression of the file you really want to look for. And then it's a the loader, which is the function. So the example for the SVGs will go through your whole source control, uh, sorry, source code, and find all the SVGs, and then pipe them through this URL loader. And there's an option set there. If it hits a certain limit, which I think is about 10 kilobytes, it will just dump these files out to disk as normal. Otherwise, if it's below that, it will bundle them up in the same package. Plugins. Whereas. Loaders work on the individual file types. Plugins work on the chunks or the whole bundle as a whole. So examples of plugins are stuff like minification with Uglyfy, um, deduplication, and then for code sharing and code splitting is a common chunks plugin. And then the final concept is where to output your bundle. It's essentially where do you want to put this? Um, so in this scenario, it's into a distribution folder. Right, so. It's demo time, so what I want to do is just kind of go through the core concepts with a little refactoring of an application just to instill the ideas and illustrate what I mean with everything. So we have a very simple weather app. It's got 
few dependencies. It's got jQuery, there's a weatherapp.js, which is my main JavaScript file. It's got an SVG, and it's got some markup. And it's 27 degrees apparently outside. Um, doesn't feel it to me. Right, so this is just the markup that we have. Nothing particularly special. This is the folder structure. Um, I've already installed Webpack because I didn't know how the connection was, and I installed one of the loaders. And I've set up a build script because npm is used very commonly with Webpack. And all this says is just run Webpack and then pipe in my Webpack config. And I've got a default Webpack config, which is basically just got an entry and an output. So if I just quickly look over the JavaScript module, it's a very simple JavaScript module. It gets some weather data from a JavaScript object and then updates the UI by using jQuery, basically. It's nothing particularly complex. So if we were to start by putting an entry point in to our app and then give it an output name. And then if we run, we can see if we look in the distribution folder, there's a new bundle JS. And if we go to our index, Change this to bundle.js and refresh. We can see everything still works. Right, all we've actually done here is set web, Webpack up. We haven't told it about any dependencies or the dependency graph. So if we go back to our application, we have an hard-coded path here, which is a dependency, which is an image, and we have jQuery. So if I were to import jQuery, because I've already got the node module installed. Come across and remove that. And if we were to build again, you should see file size is a lot bigger. What it's actually done now is it's looked through the code and said, okay, there's dependency. I'm going to pull that dependency in to the bundle. So now if we go back, we've lost jQuery from as a request, and it's now bundled in as part of the main package. Right, so if we go back to our application and we remove So what we've done here, we've explicitly defined our dependencies at the top. And now if I was to go back to the config, because it's an SVG, it needs a loader because it doesn't know how to handle this type of module. So if I was to uncomment this, what this is going to do is for the test conditions to regex, it's going to find the SVGs and it's going to pipe it through the URL loader. And I've set an option that if it's over 10 kilobytes, it will just dump it in the distribution folder. If not, it will inline it. So if we save this and now rerun, we can see if we look at the dependencies, there's now three. If we go back, if we have a look, now this is actually inlined. It's base 64 encoded. It doesn't actually make a request over the wire, which is great. So. There's one last thing. Webpack comes with a lot of built-in plugins. And if we look at our bundle size, it's 275 kilobytes. It's not exactly production ready. If we do a minus P, we can set it into production mode and it will uglify and minify our code. So if we go across, we've now got a small file size and we have inlined an asset. And that's basically the core concepts that I wanted to demonstrate about Webpack. Right. So Webpack is rather complex, and there's a lot of blog posts, and there's a lot of stuff that's not so good out there. So I've kind of went through and looked at the results, which I found useful. There's a couple of courses up there which are worth checking out, which is by Kent C. Dodds, who's um, a very popular person when it comes to Webpack. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Questions? Um, can you briefly go over just chunking? 
briefly go over chunking. Um, right, so chunking in terms of Webpack is, if we look at plugins, what plugins do, and the common, it's a common chunks plugin which actually does the chunking. It basically allows you to split. You can put points in dynamically of how you want to split your code up. That's, that's the, the high level overview of, of what it is. So, the, so basically when you're in your, uh, you define a certain chunk level as such as how far you want to go down the dependencies and then you can split on those points. Um, so I was, that was part of the original demonstration but due to time I had to take it out um, and it's much easier to demonstrate than kind of explain um, without a diagram as well. But we can talk about it afterwards without a problem. Anyone else? Yep, so you can put a... It's got a built-in dev server and it's got hot module replacement. So any React users, I would look at hot module replacement. I'm not going to go into it, but it's one of the most valuable tools. And if you want to just do a watch on the command line, you can just do hyphen hyphen watch and it will automatically reload. I did it without that for the fact that I could show you the changes instead of it magically appearing on the screen. <laughs>